In this video, we will go through the overview of System D in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7. System D acts as a new service manager that is introduced in RHEL 7 and it is backward compatible with traditional init scripts. System D reduces the boot time by executing startup services in parallel. System D services don't just have to be always running or not running based on the run level as they were with init. Services can now be activated based on the path, socket, bus, timer or hardware activation and system can respawn the system daemon as and when required. System D also supports system state snapshots that means system D can temporarily save the current state of all units and restore a previous state of the system from a dynamically created snapshot. To store the current state of the system, system D uses dynamically created snapshot units. System D uses journal D for logging purpose. By default, journal D logs are stored under slash run directory instead of the slash var slash log. Journal D logs are not in text format, so we cannot read them by simply cat command or VA editor command. We have to read them by using the journal CTL command. System D logs are volatile in nature by default and log configuration can be customized using the configuration file that is journal D.com. System D logs can be integrated with the syslog daemon. With System D, an explicit set of dependencies can be defined for each service. Instead of being implied by boot order, this allows a service to start at any point that its dependencies are met. In this way, many services can start at the same time, making the boot process faster. Likewise, complex sets of dependencies can be set up so the exact requirement of a service such as storage availability or file system checking can be met before a service starts. System D services are identified C groups which allow every component of a service to be managed. For example, the older system 5 init scripts would start a service by launching a process which itself might start other child processes. When the service was killed, it was hoped that the parent process would do the right thing and it will kill all of its children. By using C groups, all components of service have a tag that can be used to make sure that all of those components are properly started or stopped. Instead of just managing services, systemd can manage several different unit types such as devices like creating and, use, and using devices, mounts and unmounts. Uh, for example, mount file system upon request or an auto mount a file system based on a request for a file or a directory within that file system. Uh, paths, check the existence of files and directories and create or create them as needed. And services, we can start a services which often means launching a service daemon and related components. And slices, divide, divide up computer resources such as CPU and memory and apply them to selected units. And uh, snapshots. Take snapshots of the current state of the system and sockets. Set up sockets to allow communication paths to process that can remain in place even if the underlying process needs restart. Swaps that is for creating and using swap files or swap partitions and targets. Manage a set of services under a single, single unit represented by a target name rather than a run level number. Finally the timers. Triggers actions based on a timer setting. So how system D can be used for resource management purpose? The fact that, that each system D unit is always associated with its own C group lets you control the amount of resources each service can use. For example, you can set a percentage of CPU usage by service which can put a cap on the total amount of CPU that service can use. In other words, spinning off more processes won't allow more resources to be consumed by any process, any service, sorry. Prior to system D, nice levels were often used to prevent processes from, log, from hogging precious CPU time. With system D's usage of C groups, precious limits can be set on CPU and memory usage as well as other resources. A feature called slices lets you slice up many different type of system resources and assign them to user services, virtual machines and other units. Now we will see how systemd can make difference to the Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 boot process. 
When you boot a standard x86 computer to run Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, the BIOS boots from the selected medium, usually a local hard disk, and the bootloader that is grub 2 starts the Red Hat Enterprise Linux kernel and initial RAM disk that is I90RD. After that, the system D process takes over to initialize the system and start all the necessary system services. Although there is not a strict order in which services are started when a Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 system is booted, there is a structure to the boot process. The, the direction that the system D process takes at boot time depends on the default target file that is already configured in our machine. Now we will see the boot process in reverse order. So first how do we identify our default dot target? There are two ways. The first one is using systemctl command and other way is to looking at the file default dot target that is located under slash userlib slash systemd slash system. Here if you look at the file default dot target it is actually a symbolic link to the graphical dot target. That means our default dot target on this machine is graphical dot target. To understand what targets our services and other units start up with a graphical dot target, it helps to work backwards as system readers. So we will look at the dependency tree how it actually starts. From the figure 2, if you look at the graphical dot target file, we can see that this file tells systemd to start everything in the multi iphone user dot target before starting the graphical dot target and for that purpose it is using the directive called requires requires equal to multi iphone user dot target that means this this multi iphone user dot target should be loaded before we actually load this graphical dot target once that is done the wants directive tells systemd to start the display iphone manager dot service which runs the genome display manager. So, this is the watch directive. Multi iPhone user dot target starts the services that we would expect in rel multi user mode. From figure 3, if you look at the file, there is a directive, requires directive that tells the system D to start everything from basic dot target before actually starting the multi user services. The basic dot target actually starts the basic services associated with all running Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 systems. And if you look at the figure 4, we can see that basic dot target file tells the system D that it requires sys in init dot target before actually continuing for basic dot target. From the figure 5, you can see that the sys in init dot target file starts the system initialization services such as mounting file systems and enabling swap devices. From the figure you can see that it wants local iPhone fs dot target and swap dot target to load sysinity dot target. From the figure 6 if you look at the local iPhone fs dot target it says that it, it is set to run after the local iPhone fs. This is how system D takes control of the boot process and starts all the necessary services that requires to place the system in default dot target. Now we will discuss how systemd works differently compared to our traditional init process. And here I listed some of the areas that makes difference between systemd and init process. The first area of difference is system startup. The systemd process is the first process id that is PID1 to run on Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 system. It initializes the system and launches all the services that were once started by the traditional init process. The second area of difference is how systemd manages system services differently compared to the init process. For Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, the systemctl command replaces the service and check config commands. Prior to Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, once the, red, once the system is up and running, the service command was used to start and stop services immediately. And the check config command was used to identify at which run level a service would start or stop automatically. Although you can use the service and check config commands to start or stop and enable or disable services respectively, they are not 100% compatible with the Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 system CTL command. 
For example, the non-standard service options such as those that store databases or check configuration files may not be supported in the same way for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 services. The third area of difference is changing run levels. Prior to Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, run levels were used to identify a set of services that would start or stop when that run level was requested. Instead of run level, systemd uses the concept of targets to group together set of services that are started or stopped. A target can also include other targets, for example, a multi-user multi target can include NFS target and so on. There are systemd targets that align with earlier run levels. However, the point of target is not necessarily to imply a level of activity based on the run level number. Instead, targets just represent a group of services, so it's appropriate that there are many more targets available than there are run levels. The fourth area of difference is default run level. The default run level previously that used to set in slash etc slash INIT tab file is now replaced by a default target. The location of the default target is slash etc slash systemd slash system slash default dot target file which by default is linked to the multi iphon user dot target file. And the next area of difference is location of services. Before systemd services were stored as script in, in, in the inside the directory slash in etc slash initd and then they are linked to different run level directories such as slash etc slash rc3.d slash etc slash rc5.d and so on. Services with systemd are named like something dot service such as firewall, firewall d dot service and uh, crown d dot service and they are normally stored inside slash lib slash systemd slash system directory and also some of the files will be stored in slash etc slash systemd slash system directories. Think of that the slash lib files are kind of permanent files and the slash etc files as the files that we can modify for the customization purpose. The final area of difference is configuration files. The slash etc slash init tab file was used by the init process in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 and earlier versions. And this file usually points to the initialization file such as slash etc slash rc.sys init and run level service directory such as slash etc slash rc5.d, rc3.d, something like that and whatever needed to start up the system. Changes to those services was done in files uh, located in under slash etc slash sysconfig directory. But for systemd in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, there are still files in slash etc slash sysconfig directory and we can still modify how these services can behave. However, services can be modified by also adding files to the slash etc slash systemd directory to override the permanent service files in the slash lib slash systemd directories. The final topic is transitioning to systemd. If you are used to using the init process and the system 5 init scripts prior to Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, there are a few things you should know about transitioning to systemd. The first thing is Red Hat systemd still supports Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6 and earlier commands such as service, check config, run level and init. Even though they are not work exactly same as earlier versions but they can still work as expected. And the second thing is systemd still supports system 5 init scripts. There are still some services in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7 that are implemented in system 5 init scripts and we can manage them and we can list them by using the check config command. In this video we have discussed about the introduction to systemd and also we have seen how systemd logging happens and uh, how systemd handles the service dependencies. And also we have looked at the other things that systemd can do. And finally, we also, also discussed about the boot process using the systemd. Then we have a brief review about systemctl command. And finally, we have discussed about the differences between systemd versus the traditional init. And finally, we have discussed how to transit from existing init procedures to systemd procedure.